This is Malik Cook from the University of Colorado. The topic that I'll be covering today is artificial intelligence and oculomics. This is a relatively new topic for me, but one that I think will become more and more familiar, as well as more clinically relevant to all of us in the near future. My goal is to introduce basic concepts and terminology related to artificial intelligence and to hopefully succinctly touch on noteworthy publications that can help guide further exploration by you if you want to take a deeper dive. Let's get started. Let's start with why I put this talk together. Artificial intelligence is emerging from a field of promise within healthcare to one of real world application. Learning the basics about artificial intelligence will help the clinician better understand what is real from what might be just hype. Foundational knowledge will also help in the analysis and critique of publications at a time when peer-reviewed manuscripts in AI healthcare are increasing rapidly. And really one of the main reasons for putting this talk together is that it gives me a chance to learn on a topic that is relatively new to me, where I can roll up my sleeves and read some of the literature and digest and come up with my own thoughts. One of the common questions we hear about AI is that it might be the holy grail for clinical diagnosis. One way to think about the potential benefit of AI is to contemplate how you might input data, and then the output would be a very clear diagnosis with an obvious road plan for the future. Maybe we can use AI to look at optic nerves that are difficult to assess, or to try and merge data from multiple diagnostic tools to give quote-unquote diagnostic certainty, and make the clinical assessment objective rather than subjective. That would certainly make things interesting, but are we ready for that? Will we ever be ready for that? See what you think as we move through the next few slides. There are a lot of doom and gloom type quotes out there when it comes to AI and healthcare. Here are a couple, one from Jeffrey Hinton from Google Brain and the University of Toronto. If you work as a radiologist, you're like the coyote that's already over the edge of the cliff, but hasn't looked down, so doesn't realize there's no ground underneath him. And this one from Andrew Ng. A highly trained specialized radiologist may now be in greater danger of being replaced by a machine than his own executive assistant. Let's see how you feel about these quotes when you get to the end of this talk. One way to start talking about AI is to look at the different terminology. I like this quote from Voltaire, define your terms, you will permit me again to say, or we shall never understand one another. So let's dig into some terminology. The first one is data science. Data science is an interdisciplinary field that uses scientific methods, processes, algorithms, and systems to extract knowledge and insights from many structural and unstructured data. You can think of this as information you can put on a slide after analyzing data. Artificial intelligence is a broad discipline with the goal of creating intelligent machines as opposed to the natural intelligence that is demonstrated by humans and animals. It has become a somewhat catch-all term that nonetheless captures the long-term ambition of the field to build machines that emulate and then exceed the full range of human cognition. Machine learning is a subset of AI. Think of it in this way. Machine learning allows a system to achieve or enhance AI performance. It can also be thought of as a computer algorithm that can improve performance through experiences. Another way to think of it is a subset of AI that often uses statistical techniques to give machines the ability to quote unquote learn from data without being explicitly given the instructions for how to do so. This process is known as training or model using a learning algorithm that progressively improves model performance on a specific task. Deep learning in turn is a subset of machine learning that depends on neural networks. Deep learning and neural networks can be thought of as being the same thing. Another way to define deep learning is to say it is an area of machine learning that attempts to mimic the activity in layers of neurons in the brain to learn how to recognize complex patterns in data. The deep in deep learning refers to the large number of layers of neurons in contemporary machine learning models that help to learn rich representations of data to achieve better performance gains. Artificial networks can be thought of as a triad of input, hidden middle black box that we'll get to here in a little bit, and then an output. One other term that I'll include in this slide is convolutional neural networks. The most helpful definition for me is one that correlates with the biology of the human brain. Convolutional neural networks are inspired by the connectivity pattern between neurons and resembles the organization of the brain's visual cortex. 
individual cortical neurons respond to stimuli in a restricted region of the visual field, which we call the receptive field. The receptive fields of different neurons partially overlap, covering the entire visual field. You'll see this term CNN, or convolutional neural networks, often in papers dealing with AI and healthcare. Another relatively new term that I think we're going to start hearing more and more is the word oculomics. This was a new term to me that I first noted in a paper by Wagner and colleagues that I'll reference later in this discussion. Oculomics is the convergence of modern multimodal imaging techniques and large-scale data sets, which fostered an extraordinary opportunity to exhaustively characterize the macroscopic, microscopic, and molecular ophthalmic features associated with health and disease, altogether called the oculum. I recognize that this is a significant list of new terms for most clinicians, and this makes me feel more empathy for those outside of ophthalmology when we use our own language amongst ourselves. I would encourage you to take time to look up these terms and read more about the basics of AI. And to be honest, I find myself returning over and over again to the basic terms as I gain more knowledge. The language is not yet intuitive to me. Having said that, there are many other terms which we may be covered in undergraduate training, like true positives and true negatives, false positives, false negatives, sensitivity, specificity, precision, and recall, all of which can be revisited as you start to digest this field of artificial intelligence. Concepts around deep learning are extremely important, and you may ask yourself, how should you think of deep learning? We have already defined deep learning, so let's take a minute to define supervised learning and then illustrate the basics using the human brain as a corollary to what is happening inside the black box. Supervised learning is a machine learning approach that uses labeled data sets. These data sets are designed to train or quote unquote supervise algorithms into classifying data inputted into the system or to predict outcomes accurately. An example would be identifying glaucomatous optic nerves by teaching or supervising the system using glaucomatous optic nerve photos and healthy controlled data sets. Using labeled inputs and outputs, the model can measure its accuracy and learn over time. One important term to know that relates to learning over time is backpropagation. Backpropagation, short for backward propagation of errors, is an algorithm for supervised learning of artificial neural networks using gradient descent. The way that I think about this is that backpropagation is a method for taking a less than ideal output and feeding it back into the system to teach the neural network to do better next time. In contrast to supervised learning, unsupervised learning, which uses machine learning algorithms to analyze and cluster unlabeled data sets, is another important concept. This approach allows for discovery of hidden patterns in data sets without the need for human interventions, in other words, unsupervised. And an example would be a system that can cluster images of cats in a group when you input various images of different animals. The system was never taught what a cat might be, but is able to, in an unsupervised manner, categorize likes with likes. We've already defined many of the terms on this slide, but if you take a look at the right hand side, you'll see essentially what I've been talking about with input hidden layers, and then output. You begin with an input that then is interpreted by this hidden layer of, let's call them neurons, that reside within the ominously called black box, which then produce an output. Backpropagation can act to enhance the system as I described earlier, but I think you can take a look at this and what comes to mind is the neural network that exists within our cortical system. Each neuron has an activation threshold, one or zero. If the threshold is reached, it fires to influence downstream perceptrons. A perceptron is a single layer neural network, which is an algorithm used for supervised learning of binary classifiers. Binary classifiers decide whether an input represented by a series of vectors belongs to a specific class. All of this might sound intuitive to computer scientists, but certainly not to clinicians. So I would think of this simply as an input that leads to some sort of interpretation and analysis which resides within a black box, in this case, the hidden layers, and then it produces an output which we can then teach to become better over time. The promise of AI in healthcare is that it might augment our ability to care for patients. It can also enhance access to latest data and implement these data sets in real time, making our clinical decision-making better. We can automate repetitive tasks into dashboards or charting, which would make our clinical experiences better. 
can certainly make our time in clinic more efficient. There is the potential to achieve equity across resource-challenged areas, which I'll touch upon later in this talk. And there are many other areas of promise, which I think will become clear as I discuss some of the papers that have been published over the last few years. When we specifically look at the promise of AI and eye care, we can think of increased automation of test interpretation, dashboards to present pertinent data with all of the diagnostic testing that we use in ophthalmology, specifically in glaucoma with visual fields, OCTs, and optic nerve head photos. There is a potential to alert the clinician to diagnoses and care protocols, specifically with image processing to dig even deeper into the data we're obtaining. There's a chance to decrease existing tendency towards high sensitivity but low specificity. You can see the paper quoted below from O'Neill and colleagues and some of the data in Table 4 from that paper where the probability of overestimating glaucoma increases with larger disc, horizontal tilt to the disc, vertical tilt to the disc, and moderate peripapillar atrophy, whereas the probability of overestimating decreases with large peripapillar atrophy shallow disc and deep disc. There is, of course, the chance to diagnose diseases before they manifest clinically. This has been illustrated in multiple recent publications on age-related macular degeneration, where the manifestation of disease can be caught much earlier, especially the conversion from dry AMD to wet AMD. Far off into the future, there is the potential benefit of enhancing our surgical outcomes if AI systems can watch what we're doing intraoperatively and either warn us about dangers ahead or teach us about how to improve our surgical skills. The next few slides will cover some studies that I found very helpful in my journey to learn more about artificial intelligence. This specific paper on clinically applicable deep learning for diagnosis and referral in retinal disease by Defon colleagues was interesting to me with the take-home learning from this paper being that past optical coherence tomography studies use small data sets and did not include multiple pathologies to teach and evaluate systems. This study uses a small data set that was manually segmented and then fed into the neural network to achieve, number one, a deep segmentation network created a detailed device independent tissue segmentation map, and number two, a deep classification network analysis with segmentation mapping that provides diagnoses and referral suggestions. The end result is a system that can classify 3D volumetric OCT data and then recommend follow-up on par with retina specialists and retina-trained optometrists. One point on what the gold standard was for the teaching set diagnoses. The data set was made even more powerful by the researchers looking up the final diagnosis that was eventually reached and then using that for teaching the system. In other words, the system was taught in a rigorous manner by making the first images predictive of what the ultimate diagnosis was as patients traveled through the system to the specialists. In this paper on the value of automated diabetic retinopathy screening with the iArt system, we see a retrospective design which assessed the diagnostic efficacy of analyzing over 850,000 fundus images from over 100,000 consecutive patient visits collected from over 400 primary care clinics. The iArt system is an automated cloud-based artificial intelligence eye screening technology designed to detect referral-warranted diabetic retinopathy. The presence or absence of referral-warranted diabetic retinopathy, more than mild NPDR, was automatically detected by the iArt system for each patient encounter, and its performance was compared against a clinical reference standard of quality-assured grading by rigorously trained ODs and MDs. The iArt screening had 91.3% sensitivity and 91.1% specificity. The limitations of this study included the fact that it was retrospective in nature, and number two, it used only one grader without adjudication. Number three includes the mean age and mean duration of disease were not available to assess effect on image acquisition and image quality. Basically, it doesn't answer the question of whether this was harder in the elderly. The study captures variations in real-world clinical practice and shows that an artificial intelligence diabetic retinopathy screening system can be safe and effective in the real world. In this study by Lemma Aleswet and colleagues, titled Evaluation of a Deep Learning System for Identifying Glaucomatous Optic Neuropathy Based on Color Fundus Photographs, six ophthalmologists and the deep learning system known as Pegasus graded 110 color fundus photographs randomly sampled from the Singapore Malay Eye Study in a retrospective manner. 
Ophthalmologists and Pegasus were compared with each other and to the original clinical diagnosis, which was defined as the gold standard. The agreement between Pegasus and the gold standard was 0.715, whereas the highest ophthalmologist agreement with the gold standard was 0.613. Intra-observer agreement ranged from 0.62 to 0.97 for ophthalmologists and was perfect for Pegasus. Pegasus outperformed five of six ophthalmologists in diagnostic performance, and there was no statistically significant difference between the deep learning system and the best case consensus between the ophthalmologists. Now, all of that sounds great, and it might make you believe that ophthalmologists are already being replaced by these systems, but that's simply not the case, and that'll become more clear as we move forward. Predicting glaucoma before onset using deep learning. This could also be described as one of the holy grails. Could we see patients and use AI systems to diagnose glaucoma before clinicians could do that same diagnosis? The purpose of the study was to assess the accuracy of deep learning models to predict glaucoma development from optic nerve head photos several years before disease onset. The reported accuracy of deep learning to correctly identify glaucomatous optic neuropathy in past studies ranged between 0.83 and 0.98. Past studies centered on glaucoma diagnosis from images collected years after disease onset, whereas this study focused on predicting glaucoma before manifestation of clinical signs. The AUC in predicting glaucoma development four to seven years before disease onset was 0.77. The AUC in predicting glaucoma one to three years before disease onset was 0.88. And the AUC in detecting glaucoma after onset was 0.95. Testing with deep learning on images of eyes converting by Humphrey visual field and not by clinically evident changes to the optic nerve had an AUC of 0.88, while AUC was 0.97 when excluding these eyes. What I will remember from this study is this quote. In fact, we showed that by using fully automated CNNs, an AUC of 0.88 can be achieved for predicting glaucoma one to three years before the manifestation of clinical signs. Quite a statement. One of my favorite papers in this space is by Medeiros and colleagues titled From Machine to Machine, an OCT-trained deep learning algorithm for objective quantification of glaucomatous damage in fundus photographs. In this case, convolutional neural networks were trained to assess optic disc photographs and predict OCT average RNFL thickness. Over 32,000 pairs of optic nerve head photos and OCT RNFL scans from over 2,000 eyes of over 1,000 subjects were used. The mean absolute error of prediction was 7.39 microns, and to me, this is remarkable. The AUROC for discriminating glaucomatous from healthy eyes with the deep learning predictions, real and predicted RNFL values correlated with Humphrey visual field mean deviation. This approach could be used to extract progression information from optic nerve head photos that could be used for monitoring glaucomatous damage over time, and the study utilized average RNFL and not sectoral values. One huge advantage of this concept of machine to machine is that the system could be trained to correlate retina nerve fiber layer findings based on these fundus photographs, which would be much easier to obtain in resource challenged areas. In other words, fundus photographs can be taken in these resource-challenged areas, and we could still glean information that would allow us to both diagnose as well as follow progression of these patients and likely enhance care over time. I think this study is actually one of the most important ones presented because it brings home a lot of the high expectations as well as the cautionary tales that are involved with artificial intelligence studies in healthcare. This is a study that was carried out by the Google team titled A Human-Centered Evaluation of a Deep Learning System Deployed in Clinics for the Detection of Diabetic Retinopathy. The study location was Thailand, where 9.6% of the population is living with diabetes. There are 1,500 ophthalmologists, 200 retina specialists that provide ophthalmic care to around 4.5 million diabetic patients. This prospective study was done to evaluate the feasibility and performance of an AI algorithm in a real-world clinical setting. This is something that is lacking in many of the artificial intelligence studies that are done, where the population is either homogenous or the setting in which the testing takes place is very well controlled. In this case, around 20% of the images were ungradable due to poor lighting, pupil constriction, and broken cameras. Ungradable images triggered referral to ophthalmology, which became untenable due to travel, cost, and the burden on the patient. 
Corrective measures were taken, including the use of drapes and curtains to improve lighting, the cameras were fixed, and referrals were done only after review of ungradable images to try and decrease the burden, as mentioned earlier. However, I think the message is still pretty clear. Things might work very well with a homogenous population in very controlled environments, but it is another thing entirely to take these systems into our clinics and to replicate findings in different parts of the world. This is going back to the idea that artificial intelligence has to be generalizable if it will ever be an important part of the healthcare delivery system. Let's switch gears and talk about ocular biomarkers to systemic disease. I do want to take some time to discuss studies that go beyond exploring ocular diseases by connecting retinal pathology with systemic disease. This is one area of artificial intelligence studies that has tremendous implications for community health initiatives and continues to evolve as bigger data sets become available for analysis. The first paper we'll cover is Insights into Systemic Disease through Retinal Imaging-Based Oculomics. We have previously introduced the term oculome, but it is worth defining again. This area of study has emerged as a result of the convergence of multimodal imaging techniques and large data sets allowing for the characterization of the microscopic, macroscopic, and molecular ophthalmic features that are associated with overall health and disease. This paper is a good place to start to get a sense of how researchers think of accessing and utilizing large biobanks to explore the oculum. The acquisition of large data to train deep learning models is evolving, but often limited by access and quality of data. And this is the case with both eye-centered research as well as studies connecting ocular pathology with systemic disease. Of course, the major advantage in this line of exploration is that ophthalmoscopic changes in retinal microvasculature structures have been identified as independent predictors for hypertension, diabetes, coronary disease, renal disease, and stroke. Some systemic disorders may present as distinct retinal manifestations, such as the CFAN neovascularization of sickle cell anemia, the macular crystals of cystinosis, or the astrocytic hamartomas of tuberous sclerosis. The author stated that retrospective real-world data may be used successfully to investigate connections between the retinal findings and systemic disease, but is often hindered by incomplete labeling and inadequate access to health records outside of eye care. One study that highlights the potential utility of oculomics is this one, titled Prediction of Cardiovascular Risk Factors from Retinal Fundus Photographs via Deep Learning. Using deep learning models trained on data obtained from the UK Biobank, which is a population-based health data set obtained through health measurements and questionnaires, and IPEX, which is a set of fundus images obtained from patients with diabetes in a screening setting from over 280,000 patients and validated on two independent data sets of over 12,000 patients and almost 1,000 patients. The authors predicted cardiovascular risk factors not previously thought to be present or quantifiable in retinal images, such as age, gender, smoking status, systolic blood pressure, and major adverse cardiac events. The correlation of these findings was significant with an AUC ranging from 0.7 to 0.97. To give you an idea on the significance of this, an AUC of 0.5 suggests no discrimination. An AUC of 0.7 to 0.8 is considered acceptable, and an AUC of 0.8 to 0.9 is considered excellent, and more than 0.9 is considered outstanding. The limitations of the study included the use of 45-degree images, which may not translate to smaller or larger image fields, the use of a smaller data set with large confidence intervals, missing data such as lipid panels and gold standard diabetes diagnoses, and smoking was self-reported. My own conclusion is that retinal images alone performed as well as calculators in this study, but calculators are not used in a vacuum by clinicians, and AI systems are typically at a disadvantage when applied in real-world settings. Conclusions from studies like this grab attention, but don't often lead to actionable progress in the real world. Still, the findings are interesting and hopefully will take us one step closer towards application in the real world. This paper also gives me a chance to touch on precision versus recall. Precision, how many of those called positive are actually positive, can still miss a significant amount of positives despite high precision, versus recall, which is how many of all positives were actually caught and called positives. In this case, you can catch all the positives, but also many negatives and still have high recall. 
This tug of war between precision and recall is an important one in the analyses centered around artificial intelligence and should be kept in mind when reviewing papers. Another concept discussed in this paper is that of heat maps or saliency maps. We covered the idea that the black box in AI systems can be the bridge between input and output, but what happens in that black box to achieve the output is not easily deciphered. Saliency maps are a popular visualization tool for gaining insight into why a deep learning model made an individual decision, such as classifying an image in one way or another. For example, models trained to predict gender primarily highlighted the optic disc, vessels, and macula. Using the heat concept, hotness corresponds to regions that have a big impact on the model's final decision. This allows researchers to further understand which data points are important in reaching specific outputs, it can also lead to further exploration of specific connections between disease and clinical presentations that were previously unappreciated by the clinician's eye alone. One issue that comes up with trying to teach systems is the concept of passive feeding versus selective eating. AI systems typically base diagnoses on images with uncontrolled quality. This is the concept of passive feeding, leading to uncertainty about their performance. Lee and colleagues used over 40,000 fundus images to deep learning based image filtering systems for detecting and filtering out poor quality images so that selective eating can take place rather than passive feeding, essentially a way to improve the input data. In three independent data sets from different clinical institutions, the deep learning based image filtering system performed well with sensitivity of 95.6 to 96.9% and specificities of 96.6 to 98.9%. Implications for both teaching new AI systems as well as for practical clinical feedback when obtaining imaging for patient care is obvious. Can we create a red flag when repeated imaging is needed? This might be a signal for technicians when they're taking the diagnostic measurements where they can be alerted to the fact that they need to retake them before the patient presents to the physician for follow-up and review. This slide touches on one of the main shortcomings of AI algorithms when viewing it from the angle of the clinician. Existing AI approaches are associative, meaning there is a correlation being made between patient symptoms and the ultimate diagnosis. An alternative approach is proposed of using counterfactual algorithms. In other words, an approach that relates to what has not happened. This approach was found to be more accurate when compared to traditional methods, but requires further real-world testing, like all of AI in fact but is noteworthy as both an indication of what can be, as well as what present challenges are with the inherently concrete algorithmic approach utilized in AI. As research volume increases and more study groups begin to approach AI as a tool to be used in clinical activities, it is helpful to set some standards that can be followed for both protocol writing as well as clinical data reporting to our community of clinicians and researchers. Towards this end, those interested can read the proposed International Guidelines for Clinical Trial Protocols, SPIRIT AI, and Clinical Trial Protocols, CONSORT AI, which were designed to improve the quality and transparency of publications. This should also help with independent validation and the ability to recognize data sets that are not generalizable, or certainly worse, data that are not of high quality and could lead to harmful conclusions. These frameworks are based on the existing International CONSORT and SPIRIT standards, that were created for non-AI-centered research. I would encourage you to take a look if you are either a consumer or producer of AI data and publications. Healthcare equity and artificial intelligence, the adoption of AI and utilizing it in real-world settings has been proposed as one way to enhance health equity and provide new tools for resource-challenged areas to serve patients and improve outcomes. It is noteworthy that almost 9% of the global population cannot reach healthcare within one hour if they have access to motorized transport. Over 43% cannot reach a healthcare facility by foot within one hour. Access to paraprofessionals is more common in many places around the globe with the drawback of poor access to specialists. AI-empowered devices like cell phones may allow for a specialist on demand approach that can enhance both access as well as outcomes and AI-empowered devices are becoming more cost-efficient and widely available. There are multiple steps that can be taken to achieving equity in healthcare when it comes to AI systems, including teaching the basics of utilizing AI, running, adapting, and creating AI models for local use using local patients, outside collaborations to improve AI ecosystems locally, 
It should be noted that one major shortcoming of current AI data sets, the lack of diverse input data, must be addressed before these thoughts are applicable beyond a politically correct statement. It's time to put up or shut up, in my opinion, about this issue in AI. And I know organizations like Orbis are trying to facilitate new data sets that will apply to our global population. Basically, the data that I collect in Denver, Colorado, certainly won't apply one-to-one -to, -one to a patient population in Nigeria or Taiwan, for example. There are, of course, philosophical and ethical questions that come up when using artificial intelligence. The trolley dilemma is a classic experiment developed by philosopher Philippa Foote in 1967 and adapted by Judith Jarvis Thompson in 1985. The basic premise is that humans presumably have the ability to make quick decisions that take into account the consequences of actions to the self and others and make decisions that are morally and not just algorithmically correct. Will the trolley try to minimize damage to the self or to those on the rails? And will the car choose to injure the baby or the elderly lady? Similar moral questions may arise when utilizing AI in healthcare, and this is an emerging field that will be required to walk hand in hand with clinicians to produce ethics driven decision making, which still remains a challenge in our world today, independent of artificial intelligence. In line with the past slides, unintended consequences of using AI may include augmenting racial disparities instead of leveling the playing field, test challenges to investigate outcomes when algorithms are asked to verify the two photos show the same face have been disappointing. In one example, algorithms falsely match different white women's faces at a rate of 1 in 10,000. It falsely matched black women's faces about once in 1,000, 10 times more frequently. A 1 in 10,000 false match rate is often used to evaluate facial recognition systems. It has also been shown that Amazon, Microsoft, and IBM services that try to detect gender of faces in photos were near perfect in men with pale skin, but failed more than 20% of the time in women with dark skin. It is clear that we have a lot of work to do to make AI better, not just for clinical performance, but also for equitable and ethical performance. I wanted to introduce the concept of foundation models and what it means for the future of AI in the clinic. Foundation models are incomplete foundations that are adaptable to specific tasks and serve as the common basis for which many task-specific models are built. Unchecked, this can lead to homogenized AI ecosystems. Same foundation leads to the same benefits and limitations across platforms, including bugs in the system. This quote from Bomasani and colleagues is noteworthy. The goal must be to ensure the responsible development and deployment of these models on durable foundations. We envision collaboration between different sectors, institutions, and disciplines from the onset to be especially critical. It would be desirable to create unique models that can be evaluated against each other rather than trying to level the playing field early on and create unintended harmony on the side of shortcomings that are perpetuated widely. An example relevant to all of us is how Zeiss controls much of what we do in the visual field realm while keeping their inner workings in a black box. They just don't play well with others, including researchers. I think we have a chance to make things more competitive in AI and demand more transparency rather than rely on what we are given without pushback. Whenever talking about AI, it always comes down to who wins, the physician or AI. And this is one recent study that I think is worth mentioning. The CC Cruiser is an AI platform developed for diagnosing childhood cataracts. The high accuracy of CC Cruiser was previously validated using specific data sets in a very controlled environment. The objective of this specific study by Lynn and colleagues was to compare the diagnostic efficacy and treatment decision-making capacity between CC Cruiser and ophthalmologists in real-world clinical settings. They found that CC Cruiser exhibited less accurate performance compared to senior consultants in diagnosing childhood cataracts and making treatment decisions. In this case, the doctor wins, and I think that might be a good place to end the marathon of papers discussed. We still live in a world where the clinician is key to the diagnostic process, and we are waiting for AI to catch up and find its place in the clinic. I have some thoughts on how that might evolve. The story of AI in eye care is still one of promise. Studies continue and data sets are promising, but with several caveats, including serious questions about generalizability. If we have a data set of input centered in a Caucasian population, we can certainly expect that it won't perform equally in a largely non-Caucasian population. Appropriate questions about population-based biases should be asked. 
practical questions about access to imaging devices and economic feasibility involved with data acquisition and interpretation. Fundamental questions about utility of artificial intelligence compared to need for dashboards to assist. Basically, my thought here is that augmented intelligence with AI acting as a supportive mechanism to the clinician will result in smart clinical flow and enhanced outcomes that still rely on the clinician rather than on the algorithms. And we can go back to this slide that I presented earlier, Is AI the Holy Grail? After contemplating the slide and thinking about the information shared today, I wonder if you still feel the same about what might be ideal for an AI system as it relates to clinical activities. As I read more about AI, I was drawn to the idea of using AI to streamline information from diagnostics rather than to spit out a diagnosis for me to read and tabulate. I would prefer a system that alerts me to abnormalities and maybe also points out connections that correlate between different diagnostics, like a superior notch correlating with a superior RNFL thinning on OCT and inferior visual field depressions, or in the case here, a tilted nerve that may appear glaucomatous on first glance, but correlates with normal output from a normal OCT ganglion cell layer analysis, as well as normal visual field testing, or in the below case of highly myopic uh, changes around an optic nerve that is also slightly tilted and trying to distinguish this from true glaucoma versus changes that can be attributed to myopia and are relatively stable over a long period of time. We can create systems that help with normative data in a smarter way to lessen the chance for a low specificity. I gravitate towards this augmented intelligence concept that I presented in the earlier slide so that systems can act as a partner rather than an artificial diagnostic surrogate for my brain. Another way to think of my wish list for using artificial intelligence in clinic in a way that would be most useful to the clinician is following the five rules of looking at the optic nerve that you see here, looking at the scleral ring to identify the limits of the optic nerve, identifying the size of the rim, examining the retinal nerve fiber layer, examining the region of peripapillary atrophy and looking for retinal and optic disc hemorrhages, putting all of these together to identify whether glaucoma is present or not. I think if an artificial intelligence system can go through this systematically and provide a report for the physician to look at and then compare using chronoscopy or comparing the nerve today versus what you might see six months or a year from now, that might have added clinical utility because it's essentially augmenting what we do in clinic, but hopefully doing it in a more reproducible manner. We can also go back to these two quotes that we started off with. These are certainly myopic statements that are meant more to instigate emotions that are not based on current or near future realities. We can do better than playing on fear and instead address how best to incorporate AI as part of the clinical care ecosystem rather than a cyborg that will take over medicine as we know it. Future directions include creating a smart interpretation assistance platform rather than jumping to diagnostic capabilities, increasing ability to screen for disease based on low-cost diagnostics like photos, head-to-head -head trials in real-world settings with AI versus clinician outcomes with purpose to learn how AI can better support clinicians, and AI in surgical practice to increase efficiency and alert to complications before they happen. The transcript for this talk can be found at keogt.com. You can find other educational material and videos at keogt.com as well. This talk and many other educational videos can be found on this YouTube channel as well as on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for your time.